This is going to be a discussion about attacking containers. Some of my most favorite things to attack. Why? Because they work just like anything else and they're just as vulnerable. And Moses is going to give us all the deets on how to go through and destroy these things, just like every every other opportunity that we have out there. Um, so without further ado, let me pass it over to you, my friend, and get us going. Thanks, Chris. So, yeah, look at that. People are just struggling in. So, I, 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 hey, everybody. Um, man, I've been on I've been on video all day um, in one form or another. So this is going to be. It's gonna be interesting, and I haven't had a drink yet, so I'm still like pretty sober. So this this might actually work kind of well. Um, so, well, this is the, our jungle event, I guess. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Um, probably not what we thought of when, uh, when we we're talking about summer. So, uh, first of all, before we start, there is a repository out there where you can get stuff. Actually, you know what? I should make this a bit.ly link. I just realized I should probably make that a bit.ly link. Let me go ahead and do that. Uh, just because if I put this huge URL there and all these people are going to be trying to get it, they're going to be like, what is that? So for those that uh, do not want to type that big monster um, thing, I'm going to really quickly create a short URL. And uh, you can trust me as the web app dude that it's not it's totally safe it's totally safe and nothing nothing bad should happen that i'm aware of uh, uh they both do the same thing so let's see that's done that updates it and do i need to like refresh this page there we go so this is the bitly link so bit.ly and that i'll also put it in the chat channel so that people that are um, straggling in, if they want to follow along, they can actually do that from the repo. Let's go over here. Oh, no, nope, that's not right. To, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I can send that to everybody. I'll put it in the Discord. How's that? Here, I'll, I'll go ahead and take care of it for you, bro. I've got it in the chat and I'm going to put it in Discord. Perfect. Thank you. Thank yep. you, man. So, while that's going, a little bit about myself. Uh, you'll see me on Discord as the Renegade Chemist, um, you know, Red Team Persona, and, uh, you know, C is hard. So stir copy and mem copy your way through life without bounce checking. So enjoy. Um, and if you get the funny joke there at the end, then kudos to you. Um, I Google image search Jungle uh, while making this presentation. This really amazing, uh, visually stunning presentation for you today. Um, this was actually one of the image search items that came back when you actually Google search, Google image search Jungle. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how Google comes up with that, but this is what comes back. So that's a little fun fact for you. If you really like uh, searching on the internet and finding out what comes up, there you go. OK, so let me give you a little bit of background on this talk. So if you've never seen me give a presentation before, uh, you'll be better off for it, I'm sure. Um, it basically worked like this. Hey, do you want to do something on Saturday night? And I'm like, um, OK. And they're like, great. Next weekend, Saturday night, you're going to do a talk, right? Uh, OK, uh, but I'm running. A, I'm, doing, I'm doing things all week. I'm really not going to have time to prepare. Uh, I just I, maybe a couple of hours before, like I give the talk, I can put something together. Awesome, put it together. Oh, and by the way, you, there's a competing talk with Jake Williams. Oh, that's great. So for the seven people that are out there, here we go. All right. So and uh, because of the time that it took me to put this together, I made a really bad presentation for you all. It's a really horrific one. Um, and so enjoy my awesome PowerPoint skills um, while I'm doing this. It's actually a Google Doc, whatever. You don't you have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about my presentation. I shared it with you uh, so you can actually uh, bask in all of its glory. Uh, so with that said, uh, yeah, let's go, right? Let's go for a zombie run. OK, so for those that don't know what a container is, 
how do I make a like what is a container? How does it work? And we're gonna I'm gonna show all the great all the fun details, not great details, all the fun details, right? Um, so make a directory, move your user land binaries over to that directory, create a control group, and basically the control group has an allocation of like CPU and memory, and then use the control group execution command to execute stuff and remount the slash using a ch root boom container like you don't need that that's it right that that's all it is theoretically right um so <laughs> um why are they like so hard like why is they caught cache how can i break them like what is this all talk all about right so we're going to show you like container attack 101 right so first of all control groups are something of the linux that is inside the linux kernel and it's been that way for at least I don't know, <clears throat> ten, like uh, at least like 10 years, right? So Linux 2.4, Linux 2.6, and that time frame, that's when you started looking at Linux kernel and doing um, namespace work and C group work, whatever, right? Um, you know, CH root's been there forever. So how does it work? How does Docker for OS X work or Docker for Mac OS or whatever you want to call it work? They virtualize a Linux environment. Okay, so how does it work in Windows? Hyper-V. Uh, technically, in Windows 2019, it's a siloed process, but it's super bastardized to make it work like a container. Okay, so that's some magic of containers. You'll you'll see this why this is important here in a minute. Now, all the bits and pieces of a container, just so you know how it works. Docker open sourced the core of its infrastructure. They were going to make some money, basically building Container Orchestrator. That is until Kubernetes came out, <laughs> and then their business model basically exploded. Um, but anyway, before that, Docker, uh, they uh, created this, they open source a bunch of this stuff. Run C is what runs the container and actually does all the, the kernel work. Container D manages the containers themselves and uses Run C to run the container. And then you have these two other processes that one you may know of, Docker, but there's a Docker daemon uh, Docker D daemon um, that actually controls how the Docker D operates. By default, it's bound to a Unix socket. We'll talk about that here in a minute. So if we're going to play around with Docker, let's go ahead and actually get some stuff going. Um, in here, okay, if you haven't got Docker installed and you're brave enough to like, you know, download a script, you can actually read the script. Uh, and it's on like a Ubuntu-based, Debian-based distribution, you can go ahead and use that script that I provided to actually um, go get your Docker installed. And it takes maybe all of uh, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever, okay? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put this in the Discord as well, just so that people have the install script for Docker. But you do need Docker, either Docker desktop or Docker, Docker running, right? Whether you do it now or later, that's just going to be a prerequisite step. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see. Um, now, you, you already called the repo, that's cool. So Lab Zero is making sure things are running, okay? And I just wanted to give you a quick tour of Docker, right? Just one on one tour. Okay, so let's go ahead and real quick, uh, I'm SSH into a Linux, my Linux host actually. Uh, let's go ahead and Docker uh, run Hello World. If you don't have the Hello World um, container, it's going to pull it down and run it. it. Says, hey, you've done your Docker installation correctly. That's what happens. If you don't uh, give you some magic here, if like I already have it, I have a few containers that I built out in my system. Um, let me see if Hello World is still in there. Docker PS, Docker image, uh, hello? Let's see, is it uh, grep hello? Oh, image LS, sorry. So let's see. Uh, yep, let's go ahead and kill that. Oh, so somebody said, uh, somebody had an audience question real quick for Cali. 
can you run uh, Docker in Kali? You can run Docker on almost any distribution of Linux and on almost any um, OS, really. I mean, it's very portable. You can even run Linux containers inside of Windows Docker. And the reason you can do that, Hyper-V. So, you know, it's going to require resources because it's going to boot up a window environment, like a Windows environment, right? Hyper-V. Can you do it in, in, in Kali? Yes. It might even be natively installed. It depends on the Kali build. Not sure what mm -hmm. they're doing yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's natively installed. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and delete this container just so you could see what happens. Um, hello, dash world. Oh, I have to destroy this container that references it. So if you get that error, like, hey, how do I delete this container? Um, you do a Docker RM the container, and then you kill hello. Uh, Oh man, look how many containers I have referencing hello world. <laughs> oh boy, I hope I don't have too many. Let's see. Uh, you might run into this, by the way. Any others? Yep. Just shows you how many times you've actually run containers. Let's see. I may have to clean this up later. I want to show you what a fresh container pool would do. There we go. So when you want to run it for the first time, you're going to see something like this. It can't find it local. Okay, I'm going to go run, you know, I pulled this image down and I'm going to go run Hello World. Okay, now it tells you you can do some other things, okay, but I've shown you a few commands. So um, let's do one real quick just so you can see. You don't have to do this with me. We're going to do a lot of these over time. But as an example, let's just say that we did um, Docker run, uh, BusyBox, SH. Or actually, no, maybe something more fancy. Docker run. So I is interactive. T is tagging it. We're daemonizing Nginx real quick. I just wanted to kind of show you how this would work. OK, if you have something that's demonized like this, what you can do to kind of uh, make sure that things stay functional or, or to attach to it, I guess, as you can do a few ways, you can attach to it by name. Um, this this doesn't have a name, so I may have to attach to it like this. Uh, hold on, Docker attach. Uh, the, oh. uh. So now I'm attached to that container. The container is kind of running Nginx, so there's nothing really, no logs, nothing really going on. So. I can do a Docker. Hey, hey Moses. Yeah. It's uh, your your bandwidth. So you're having some uh, some clip outs. So I don't know if you've got some stuff running that you can maybe sh shut off. Uh, Looks like you're lo I, you're locking up a bit no. on video. Maybe turn your video off and see if it keeps the audio going. Uh, yeah, maybe. Hold on, let's see. I'd love to see you, man. But you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, does that work better? Well, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah, especially since I'm going to be like restarting stuff a lot. Um, you know, it's always good to keep the the host nice and fresh. And if anything, I can go to another machine and I can do this remotely too. So, um, but hey, you know, the fun of doing live demos, right? All right. So, um, Docker exec. If you want to run something fun, right? Like like something more interesting. Docker ps. Oh, actually, I don't see the nginx container. So Docker PS, hey, look at this. So here's a container, here's the image, here's the, actually this right now is gonna be as close to the image name as you can get the reference name, you know, the, the name of the container. It's actually called focus something or another, right? That's actually the name of the container. Uh, let's do this again, focus cart rate, because I didn't name it, it comes up with its own name. Uh, for now, just for, for grins, right? To make this easier for everybody to kind of work with. You can just grab this and do Docker run. So I'm running something in this container. I actually have to run it like this. Running something in this container. What am I gonna run? Bin bash. So minus I is interactive. 
uh, tag. I'm tagging the container with the container ID bin bash. I'm, uh, I'll maybe just run it like this. Ah, oh, that's weird. Am I not? Well, I may have to run it with the name. Strange. Da, 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 da. Right click, boom. That is really weird why I can't, oh, sorry everybody. Docker run, it's been a long day. I've only been doing this for 10 or 12 hours. Uh -huh. <laughs> sorry, that's how you do it. Um, so we're executing bin bash in the container. So now notice the prompt. We're gonna get more on this in a minute because this is important. But basically the container is an interesting beast because you know, PS isn't on here as an example. Um, depending on the container, your system binaries might not be there. Um, you have to go look in bin to see what's there. Way less binaries that you're used to. So if you're used to like hacking out a box and saying, oh, you know, I'm used to netcat, I'm used to curl, I'm used to all this stuff being there. It's not there. Now you can install it. You can actually do apt in some of the containers. So you can do like apt update, and then you can actually like install a package manager. Uh, but containers are basically user land binaries, okay? So this container might be Ubuntu, let's see. LSB release, no. Uh, could be Red Hat, no. Um, Debian. So this this uh, this particular um, uh, container, right, is actually doing a pretty, you know, it's doing it's doing a Debian type of process. So pretty cool, right? Um, so uh, a couple of other things that we can take a look at with a container is container networking, real quick. If we have access to it, we don't have access, so. Uh, we don't have even if config, right? So uh, we might be able to do ENV and get it this way. Nope. So how do I find out what the heck the container network is, if it even has one? Well, if the container is running, you could do a container inspect, okay? And then you could do a container inspect of the container itself and figure out what's going on in the container, right? So you could see everything about this container, how it started, what's running it. Notice that Nginx is running in the foreground, not in daemon mode. You need to be able to run in the foreground. I'll show you why in a minute. Um, this is all the different container uh, bounds, uh, capabilities of the kernel, CPU capabilities, paths. Um, and more importantly, you're gonna see the container networking information here, okay? And this is what Docker orchestrates for you, okay? Now, with that said, that's like level zero, right? So we got to go faster if we want to get through this. All right, so lab one. So where did I put all my lab stuff? I put it in the jungle directory, in the jungle container directory. Um, so here's lab uh, one. Lab one, we have a Docker file. The Docker file basically says how you're going to build things, right? Or how you're gonna run things, okay? So here's an example of what you would do to build a Docker file. You'd say, hey, Docker, um, I want you to build a container. I want you to tag it. Uh, sorry, not I. I want you to tag it. Uh, we're gonna call it um, Joongle Labs Lab 1. And where do we wanna build it from? This directory here, dot, okay? You hit go and it builds the container, all right? Yours is gonna build slower than mine because I've already downloaded the layers, okay? So yours is gonna take a while to pull down Ubuntu, build the container. And if you notice, the container has one job to run bin bash, okay? That's all the container is doing, bin bash, right? So we're gonna go ahead and do a Docker run of the jungle lab one bin bash. <laughs> oh, it did work in it. Oh, it's, it's doing that weird, it's doing its weird self. <laughs> Hold on, gotta run it in interactive mode. If not, it ends up being, ah, it ends up being weird. All right, hold on. Let me, uh, I'm gonna have to kill it. I'm gonna have to kill that container. 
because uh, it's not in interactive mode, so it's doing the weird shell thing. Uh, come on. Always have a second window open. Oh. Oh, caps lock on top of everything else. Okay. So, uh, Docker PS, Docker Kill, uh, Laughing Borg. Uh, Oh man, it hung up this shell. Okay, no. Reset. There we go. So if you want to run this container, you'd probably have to run it with the I in it for interactive mode. There we go. So now you can see in here that the container is an Ubuntu container. Okay. However, and it's an Ubuntu 20, it's the latest container. Okay, which or the latest version of Ubuntu. You can version these things, okay? But this is just a bash prompt, right? And you know, it's running in a certain way. We haven't gotten to the to this part yet, but just understand that this is just how the containers operate, right? So you run a container, you build it, great. So what can I do with a I believe the exiting the container will kill the container, and it does. Um, let me actually exit this container as well. Cartwright. Okay. They're pretty. They're they're pretty simplistic kind of beasts, right? So let me show you how we're going to run a different container. So if you go to Lab Two. Lab two is going to have a Docker file that has Nmap as the execution path. So what happens when we build that one, right? Because first of all, we have something called entry point, and this is a special command in Docker that basically says when you run the container, this is the command that you're going to run. Um, so let's kind of just see how this works. So so here's Docker build. Right, and you want to build Nmap. By the way, this works for anything, right? Interpreter, uh, this works for Metasploit, this works for everything, right? So you build an entry point, you build a container, say, hey, I want to build a container called Jungle Lab 2. It builds it. Notice that it that it sends the build to the daemon and it says, Great, I'm gonna build this out. And now I've got a Docker container called Jungle Lab 2. When I go to run it in interactive mode, Jungle Lab 2, the Nmap prompt, because Nmap was the entry point. So that means that I can actually run uh, Nmap from my bot, from my container, right? So let's do a, a quick check, Nmap localhost, And it says everything is closed. Huh. Well, I know I have stuff opened to myself. So why does Nmap say that everything is closed? Right? And by the way, this is what we did here. Um, well, Nmap didn't say that everything was closed to your host. Nmap said everything was closed to the local host of the container. And the container's local host is only running Nmap, right? So if you want to scan something, you could. You'd have to do it by, by IP address. That's right? And, and it shows you, I mean, this is Nmap running in a container, outputting the commands. Um, now, the other problem you're going to have, though, you're going to have a couple of questions. I, I know, like, okay, so, like, if I write out a file, uh, like, temp scan or file to temp scan, but the containers are not persisting 
any of the data. So the container is going to discard whatever was written in temp, and that's it. It's gone, right? So you need to actually do something to make the container not discard the data sets that you're putting in it. Okay. Now, from the container's point of view, it just says, "Hey, I, I don't, I just don't have any data." That's because the container's network is almost like a bridging network. It's almost like a internal network to itself, right? So that's the problem there. So, with that said, there's another thing you should know about, which is, can you change the entry point? So Nmap, when you compile it, it compiles with other things like Nping, right? Which is Nmap's, um, uh, um, kind of like Hping, it's a packet crafter. So you could say, okay, Nmap, um, I want to run a container and I want the entry point to be Nping. Do the Nping. That's another example of the container running a different binary, right? And then discarding itself. So these things are basically designed to help package software, right? Now, this is what, what's interesting. So what if you wanted to persist data, right? Because you saw the data gets discarded, right? So you can discard or you can persist data. You can actually mount a host volume inside of the container. This is going to be critical, right? So here's an example. In lab three, we're going to go ahead and run. Well, we're going to go ahead and build it first. You got to actually build lab three. So if you don't have lab three, you got to do a Docker minus I. Uh, yeah, Jungle lab three. Um, just build it real quick, just like we've been doing all along. Something like this. If you build it, it will come. <laughs> now, if you build it, then you can run it with this tag, right? That's really what you can do. If you didn't build it, it'll just download the MariaDB binary, which isn't a big deal. Um, because what I really want to show you was you build a container like this with a MySQL root password sort of runs, okay? And you tell it you want to run in daemon mode. So it's going to run as a daemon, okay? You say that you want a volume mount and you want to mount data, the data directory, into var lib MySQL, right? And uh, Jungle Lab 3, yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yep, it's running in the background. Awesome. So it's running. And if you want to interact with it, you can. OK. Uh, but. It's running a volume mount, and if you do a dot, so if you do a Docker inspect of either the container ID or the container name, doesn't really matter which. Um, it gives you a bunch of stuff, and what I want you to key in on is this this volume mount. So it says that the internal data directory is mounted to the host is this volume, right? So you can go there and take a look. You can go into var lib docker. Oh, sorry. CD var lib docker. Docker. Um, oh, permission denied. Huh. So maybe I have to be root. OK. So you say, all right, you be root. Var lib docker. Uh, Uh, oh, sorry about that. It's that weird. Oh, there it is, the bottom. Uh, volumes, data, data, right? So right now there's nothing, okay? But you can see that this thing is running system D, right? And if you look, you've got all of these volume mounts in here, right? 
So let's talk about what overlay FS is. So when you build a container, and especially when you name a container, right? When you build a container, um, you actually start to build layers in the in your operating system, okay? And basically, what happens is when you look at the Docker file, whichever Docker file you want to look at, and uh, let me exit here real quick so I can show you a Docker file. Um, projects, uh, Joomla, uh, when you look at a Docker file, right? Each one of the entries in the Docker file is a different overlay file system setting. And what happens is when you start with a base image like Ubuntu, right? It doesn't go and download it again. It says, oh, the Ubuntu uh, base image was SHA-256 of this. Do you have it? Yes. Okay, from that SHA-256, I'm going to do a diff of that layer with this command. And it stores the diff. And then you do another diff of that layer with the next command. And so the overlays, when you start concatenating them all together, or overlay FS does this, it equals the actual container that you're in. So quite literally, if you want to go and uh, navigate a container, you can go into var lib docker volumes. You can go into one of these um, SHA-256s and depending on which one you pick, you're going to have a file system, right? And so some of the earlier ones may show you some of the base images, and you could tie these together. You know, let's see if I can find one about, uh, that's pretty old. Well, that's one of these. No, it's just data. Um, That's just data also, those are databases. Not having an easy one today. I thought I was just had one earlier. Ah, uh, sorry. Let's try this one. Uh, I could do the, the work and actually try to find it now. Let me see if I can find the word uh, diff. Find dot slash minus name diff. Ah, there we go. Oh, it's an overlay too. My bad. It's an overlay too. Sorry. Let's look at the wrong place. There we go. So here's a diff in the file system for overlay two, right? Uh, so depending on the OS, depending on what you're trying to do, you may have different OS. Look, this one is Alpine Linux, right? So this is actually the the what's running in that container for that image, right? So with that said, you know where the things are in the image. Let's look at what happens when you want to run the containers. So who am I? I'm Moses. My ID is 1000. So I'm the first user on this system, but I am in the Docker group. Okay. So when you run a, let's say when you run uh, something, so running, let's do, do, let's do lab four real quick. I've given you the command line. Docker run ITDV PWD temp temp nginx. When you run this, okay, you run this, uh, you run this, and this is why I give you the command. Go in the container, or you run, let's say, Docker exec, uh, let's see, Docker ps, Docker exec. This, right? When you touch this file, right? What do you touch it as? So I remember, I am user. I am UID or ID one thousand. My username is Moses. When I go into temp, because I mounted, so notice that. This temp was mounted into the container. That's what I did. Uh, well, did I actually do that? Maybe I didn't do that. 
Uh, Docker PS. Let's look at that. Did I actually mount the the right volume? Uh, mount, 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 mount. Uh, and you know what? I probably picked the wrong one. Oh, yeah, I didn't pick the Nginx one. Sorry, didn't pick the Nginx one. That's why that didn't work. Uh, this one. When I mount the right volume here, my mistake. Uh, like this. Okay, I go into temp, and there is my ha ha ha, right? But if I do an LSLA, that file was written as root. So wait a minute. I executed a task as a lower privileged user, but I wrote a root file onto the host. Hold on a second. How? So this is how. You run a container. The container runs a daemon. That daemon has elevated privileges, can actually be root, and it runs whatever you want as root, but it runs it in a container. Okay? That's what it does. So you're like, oh man, I got root, but I got root in a container. How can I leverage this to my advantage? So, Red Hat calls these things super privileged containers, all right? Super privileged containers are nothing more than a container that is running as a privileged mode. Remember, containers are for operations and software packaging. They're not for security, right? So Red Hat packaged all of its tools for administrators, kind of like the Windows uh, RSAT tools, right? The remote system administration tools. Um, Red Hat package them as a container because it makes sense. And to run it, you need to have privileges on the host. So let me explain what this command does. This command, what it does is it runs this IPC, right? And actually, I wish I could draw on this thing. It runs this IPC. It basically mounts the host's inter process communication, the host networking, the host PIDs as a privileged container and mounts the host file system into the container. So basically, you run the container as if you're on the host. So if, so the point of this process is, if you have a user that is running as a non-root user, but they can run a Docker daemon, right? They're in the Docker group and they're just in that group, they can run a container as root as a privileged user, right? In the in its default setting, right? And getting and basically doing privesk. Okay. Um like a boss, right? Uh so let's and by the way, uh, if you want to see this running, right? If you really want to kind of play around with this, um we're going to do this in a second, but I'm going to give you a kind of a sneak peek here. Sneak peek here. Go to Lab 5. Lab 5 has got this. So if you wanted to run this, right, if you just literally copied this out and said, you know, paste, you, uh, oh, I've already got the container running. Let me, let me delete the container, right? You're going to run, and by the way, it's CentOS, right? You saw that I went from Ubuntu to CentOS. And the reason I went from Ubuntu to CentOS is because what is a container? It's a bunch of user land binaries married to the Linux kernel. Okay? And so now if I go to host, this is my host OS. And how do I know it's my host OS? Because I can go into Etsy, I can cat LSB release, and it's running pop OS. And I can cat the host name and I know the host name. So I'm running as root using that command. So I'm gonna pause for a second because in like 
40, in like 40 minutes, I gave you a lot of things to think about. Before I go on, are there any questions? I think, David, that's a no. Uh, or yeah, I'm Chris, my hand, uh, yeah, or just or Chris. Anything yet. Yeah, okay, cool. So now, before I ran into this thing, this conference, I looked at Shodan. And I went, okay, so I'm going to show people how they can do this through a network daemon, right? Which is possible, which is possible, okay? However, how many people are not just crazy enough to run Docker host daemon on 0000? Because you've got to actually like work at this. You've got to actually have effort to do this, right? How many people have actually done Docker host 000? And then, how many people have exposed the Docker port to the internet, to the freaking internet? And how many of them have the word Docker in it, right? Which would give you more of an indication that the type of the, of the port that's running is Docker. And it turns out that it's about 6,000 hosts on the internet that may or may not be running in this mode. All right? So, so, this is pretty kind of wild, right? That there's actually people that do this, but it turns out there might actually be, which is like, this is like super bad. Like do not run it this way, right? So to be safer, okay, I'm gonna show you how we're gonna just show you what this does. So what this does is, is Docker has the ability to, to bind itself to a socket, okay? And it can do this in a secure and insecure way. Um, and because Docker is just an API to run stuff, um, you can do this on Windows, you could do this on Mac, you could, I mean, it's just pretty crazy. So what you could do is you could stop your Docker process, right, which I'm gonna do now. Um, just go. Okay, and on top of stopping my Docker process, I'm going to restart it here in the foreground of, actually, I'm going to start in the other window in the foreground. I'm going to start in the foreground, but I'm going to bind it to my local host as well. So it's going to be running on a, on the Unix socket, and it's going to also be listening on a local host, okay? So, you know, if you do that here, or actually it's this command. So if you do that here, oh, no. I don't know why it's not copying and pasting. There we go. Uh, oh, that did is root. So you got to be root. You could see that it says, all right, I'm listening on this port and I'm listening in, in sock, right? So, you know, to test it, you could say Docker minus H. It may even be, yep, minus H. Uh, 127001 PS, run the PS command. So uh, maybe it's capital H. Yeah, it's capital H. I'm sorry, it's not lowercase h, capital H. Um, Docker capital H 127001, the PS command, that seems to work. So, you know, if we did some of the old, you know, some of the old legacy ones like run a daemon, right? So let's just run a, a quick daemon here. Um, yep, great. And you can see that it says, well, it's not running yet. Yeah. Did it? Well, I ran it locally, so yeah, let's see. Yeah, it's not really updating this. It will, it will. Um, Let's go ahead and go in there. Docker exec 
uh, Frosty, Curan, Bin Bash, right? This is running over localhost. And if you really want to prove it, you can actually do a, you know, you can go into your box, you can do a pseudo uh, TCP dump on that box, and you can actually, you know, look at, Two, three, seven, five, and you know because it's not encrypted, you'll probably see the 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 bin. Uh, wait, uh, Docker exec minus it the bash shell, right? Yeah, so there it is, right? So here you are interacting with that bash shell, right? And so if this was bound to port zero, like we're seeing on the internet. That's kind of crazy, right? Because this is like command execution, basically, but worse, okay? Because, you know, if you wanted to do something really evil to these boxes that are running in this way, and they're running in a default, well, a somewhat default fashion, right? You could do something pretty crazy. You could say, hey, Docker, I want you to connect to that host um, on, on 127.0.0.1, I want to run a container. You can call the container whatever you want. So you can, if they're already running an Nginx container, you could call it Nginx, right? You could kind of fool them to call it something else. Um, you can then say, I want to do a privileged pod with all the privileged stuff, and I want to go ahead and mount the host. I want to run a BusyBox shell, and it will basically run it. Let's call this one, I don't know, Apache 2 or something. Right, and now I've got a root shell remotely on a box, right? If you wanted to like, de de detach this, you could kind of detach it and just see it running somewhere else. But now I've got a root shell, you know, running on this box. And, you know, if you really, uh, minus VVV, right? Uh, see if we can get more packages to go. Oh, actually minus X would be best. <sighs> Minus X and S zero and yeah, that's fine. Um, right, and here's the host mount again, right? So once again, you could do that remotely, right? You can see that I'm interacting with the box um, kind of remotely. You can see my root directories here with all the terminal escape characters and everything. So pretty, pretty crazy that you could do this. Now, um, there are People that actually do, um, if you don't know, that there's actually a way to confine this in like Kubernetes. So if you're running Kubernetes, there is something called a pod security policy that if you, um, per privileged pod, right? So, you know, hopefully if you are running a Kubernetes environment, which runs containers, there actually is a way to do a pod security or yeah, pod security policy that restricts the privileged access, you know, the privileged pods. So uh, yeah, see, allow privesc, right? Or do not allow privesc or default allow privesc or, you know, allow for uh, privileged pods to be started, right? So that you can't, you know, create a privileged pod, right? So you could actually set your pod security policy to to deny it. And I believe by default, this is not on. So you may want to consider enabling this, right? So the, what would end up happening there is somebody finds a Kubernetes um, host that is open and available to the to the world. And you know, just like you saw the container that I ran, that was a bash shell um, over the Docker API, you could do the same thing over the Kubernetes API and kind of host things, right? So with that said, I kind of want to show you that, yeah, containers are not magical, right? Actually, they could lead to privesc in, in certain cases, right? So they're made for software packaging. They're not, they're, they're made for ops, right? They're not made necessarily for security. So be careful, don't expose these things. You know, don't have your developers expose these things. If you find this thing, you've got another way of getting root now 
on a on a on a Linux box. And by the way, you there is a potential that this could lead to escalations in Windows as well. I'm kind of still playing around with that. Uh, and that's all I got. So I'm open for questions and the like. Uh, hey, thanks a lot there, Moses. Uh, um, if anybody has, has any questions, please uh, put post them in the chat or you can post them to the uh, Track One team in uh, Discord. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I didn't I didn't actually mention this, but um for people who run like you know framework, like if you actually run the Metasploit framework, um we didn't get into it today, but if you go into the GitHub, um you will see that um there is a Docker file in here um with like a Docker ignore. And so here's a Docker file and a Docker compose as well. So you can actually use Docker Compose to build your uh, Metasploit framework as a container with, you know, Postgres and the like, and you don't have to fiddle with doing all the dependencies of getting framework to fire. Um, I, I think it's uh, probably reasonable to run it in this way. Um, Oh, uh, which by the way, I saw that Docker requires a reboot. Is that on Windows or or Mac? I should have asked. All right. Well, if there's nothing, if there's no questions, then uh, I think we're good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Moses, for for dropping this knowledge on everybody. Um, you know, feel free if you want to 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 uh, just hang out a little bit and in, into uh, Discord if anybody has any questions. But uh, have a great rest of your day, and uh, we'll see you guys in the next sessions.